there are so many different um, business models that we can use. We really have to manage them like an like an IT portfolio. Um, but this is this is the business portfolio that that moves us into the technology. We need the technology to support it. And there are many different types of business models. And some of the categories are business to business. We have business to consumer, business to government, and we have government to business. Government to business is where the data hub and our and our service delivery platform, that project, that's where that's where that lives. That's that business model. Government to business. And you might hear of it um, on the internet, um, talked about as government as a platform. A platform is a business model as well. We're really familiar with platform business models through Amazon. Um, Amazon, um, I think, makes more money now off of their platform business model than they probably did selling books in the beginning um, through their through their Amazon Web Services. And those, um, you know, those are things. If we're, you know, people in the audience are familiar with knowledge management. Those are really knowledge services that Amazon developed. They took their they took their knowledge of their internal operations, their perfected business processes, and they created supportive technology to support those things that created those internal efficiencies. And then they opened it up to the industry to use to support other businesses, and they're making money from that. Um, so here we we talk about um, our line of business portfolio. Um, and we look at our support service portfolio. And our support services, and this is just going back to the basic primary services within an organization and support services within an organization. Our information technology or support services, our human resources, procurement, budget, and finance, those are all support services for our for organization. Um, and, and we need technology to support the business processes within those as well. So how does a business, how does business model diversification work? Um, Netflix is a really good example of this. And so they had in the beginning two different business models. They started with a with a basic their basic business model, um, and they were mailing DVDs out. And then they moved on to online streaming. And so they were they had originally replaced. Um, going into your local store, going into your local blockbuster to pick up a movie. It was easy. Uh, they changed the distribution channel um, and they, they made the service more, um, more convenient for the customer. So instead of having to drive to blockbuster and, and then having to drive back to bring your, your DVDs back, all you have to do now is walk down to your mailbox. This created a different relationship with the customer by changing the distribution channel. And so these are some of the elements that we look at within the business models that help us be more competitive. And these are things that we're looking at within state to help the state become more efficient and provide better services and develop partnerships that can provide better services through different distribution channels. So, what are the government to business and government to government models? These are, and, and again, the Data Hub project really lives in the realm of government to business and government to government. Because what we're doing is we're looking at creating internal efficiencies for the state of Alaska. And to do that, we have to be able to create interoperability between our data across departments, divisions, quasi agencies. We also want to be able to share our data with the federal government. We want to be able to connect data and share data with local government and with our partners. So imagine that um, for we. The state of Alaska has a few different partnership programs right now. One is with the Department of Motor Vehicles. And this has been an ongoing partnership for um, about 15 years. And they open up their information systems. And I'm not sure if anybody um, in, the, uh, in the audience has been to one of these satellite locations. But these satellite locations are able to offer um, a DMP services. You can go and you can renew your driver's license. Um, you can uh, get tags for your for your car. 
and so forth. They're only able to do that because they can tap into our information systems through the state of Alaska and to provide those services. We have one of our partners is in Anchorage, UMB, and they do about $10 million a year in business for the state of Alaska. They're a partner. So the state of Alaska does not have to open new locations. They've developed partnerships. They've developed a business model that supports partnerships so that they can provide services through a different distribution channel, which improves the delivery, the service delivery to the client in the end. We want to be able to take that one step further. So instead of that partner just tapping into that one information system and just being able to provide the services using the existing user interface, we would like for them to be able to tap into an application programming interface, a web service, that allows them to create other services and change the distribution channels even more. Imagine if you were to receive, just like you receive from AT&T if you forget to pay your cell phone bill, you get a text message and it says, press one if you want to pay now. And we're all about that. Like, oh, that's easy. I forgot. I'm going to press one. I'm going to pay now. How easy is that? Imagine if your driver's license was about to expire within the month or so. And in the state of Alaska, and I don't know if this is the same for other states, our driver's licenses usually expire on our birth dates. And I myself have driven almost a week before my driver's license expired. So imagine that you receive a text message from one of our business partners that's using our application programming interface to create an information system that texts you. And it says, would you like to renew your driver's license right now? It goes out to, I don't know how many people, 50,000 people in the state of Alaska whose driver's licenses are going to expire this month. And let's say that 30% of them decide to renew their driver's license right then and there. That return on investment for that partner is pretty high. So they're willing to put in the time, the effort, the resources that it takes to develop in that application layer using our infrastructure that the state has put in place to be able to reinforce that partnership. So that's government to business. Government to government, these are the partnerships between state organizations or state entities that create internal efficiencies. And what we're really doing is we're looking at what are the business processes that are repetitive, that are duplicative across the state of Alaska? How do we standardize those things? And then how do we digitize those using the data hub and our service delivery platform so that we can standardize and streamline and reduce overhead? So it makes government, the data hub and the service delivery platform are going to make government more efficient. How can government to business and government to government models help us make sense of innovation? So innovation is something that we hear a lot about. And I just love this word cloud. And this was actually from the Irish agri-food industry. But really when you look at it, the elements that are coming into play here are the things that we really think about. You know, generalization of what is innovation? Some of the big topics are technologies, improvement, process, product. The value is huge. Value brings us back to the business model. So there are nine elements of a business model. And this is according to Alexander Osterwalder's business model ontology. And so we have partners. You've heard me talk about that. We have activities and resources. Our partners, like UMB, are those who are, you know, in private industry. We could partner with local government. We can partner with organizations, communities, constituents. But our partners perform activities on our resources in the way that I had explained before. 
So um, our partner, UMV, um, would develop an application using our application programming interface is the resource that they would use to then change the distribution channel to be able to better service our customers. So then the state of Alaska becomes the provider of the infrastructure. We also become the governance entity over our business processes. Our business processes are defined by statute. So it all ties back to what we're, we're legally supposed to be doing, the, the, the services that we're supposed to be providing to the state of Alaska. The next element um, in an effective business model are relationships, customers, and channels. And again, we, we spoke about that, um, you know, the UMV example is that they would, um, they would provide services to, um, to our communities and our constituents. Um, they're going to change distribution channels. And in doing that, they're changing the relationship that they have with the customers. So instead of um, our customers for motor vehicles having to go into a location to remove their driver's license, they're able to, um, to do it on their cell phones. So a change in distribution channels is improved service. So how can government to business and government to government models develop a common business model language? And so this is really important because when we're looking at um, you know, the transformation process, it's really creating not only interoperability across domains um, or different knowledge areas like education, healthcare, energy, um, but also developing um, business models that carry across those domains and developing um, those, those ontologies that create interoperability of data across those domains. So when we look at um, how, how we've developed information systems within the state of Alaska historically, they're very siloed. So we might have a, a priority, and that priority will get split across a couple of different departments. It could go, um, you know, there are pieces that are carried out by health and social services and pe pieces that are carried out by education. But because of the way that we've budgeted in the past, each health and social services or education will each receive um, a, um, funds to develop their information systems to support their, their services separately. So we can never bring that data back together and be able to make informed decisions on whether or not are we being efficient? Are we being effective? What are we learning from, from what we've done? So the data hub and our service delivery platform is going to allow us to create that interoperability across our information systems so that we can understand if we're being efficient, if we're being effective. And those are across these domains, across education, across healthcare. This is also very important when it comes to um, reporting, federal reporting um, for the state of Alaska. We receive a lot of our funding, federal funding from the federal government, and we have to abide by their open data reporting standards. So we need to be able to connect into effectively and efficiently connect into the information systems for the federal government to be able to, to report back to them, whether that's Medicaid or Medicare um, or any of our grant programs, um, being able to, to push data in the format that they want in resource description framework or JSON. Um, those are all very important elements um, of data interoperability. Hey, Heather, this is Doug. So, uh, we so got this is my, um, my Heather. Yeah, this is Doug. I, so we've got to jump in. We yeah. have another presenter queued up. So, um, is there any way we can uh, okay. wrap up in a minute here? Yeah, we sure can. Okay. We sure can. So this is my last slide, um, and what we're really what we're really looking at here is you know why is government concerned with business models? We're concerned with that because they help create internal efficiencies for the state of Alaska. They create economic development through partnerships. And this is where we want partnership. We want to develop these partnerships with business to use our data assets and our digital assets 
to just help create economic development. Um, when we have businesses like UMD who are partners with us and they're doing $10 million worth of business in a year, they're also employing people. They're paying, um, you know, for the retirement, they're paying benefits. This is very important for economic development. Um, and then improved service delivery. We see how that improves the end service delivery to, to our customers instead of we're meeting them on the terms that they want to receive the service. Um, and um, this is just, I wanted to give an example. There are many states that are going in this direction. The UK um, is, is also going in this direction with government as a platform. Um, and this is what the, the Data Hub projects of the state of Alaska and our service delivery platform, this is, this is the call that we're answering right now. Um, that's it. Thank you all. All right, that's great. And so if you don't know, uh, so there's a, uh, just real quick, a couple quick milestones, Heather, that are coming up here in the fall and maybe the winter about the Data Hub project and where they can learn more. Okay, so um, right now our, our, we have a, a couple of milestones um, this month. We're going to be um, finishing up the uh, requirements analysis phase and we're going to be looking at uh, putting together our funding request um, that uh, will go to the legislature. One of the things that we've done, we, uh, we hosted um, Alaska uh, Community Innovation Summit, and uh, Doug had presented at that. Um, and the summit was really to, to bring people together, to bring potential partners together, to inform the state of Alaska what data resources would you need to, to help build these business, to help build your business model, to help help provide better services to change distribution channels for services um, for the state of Alaska. And I'm very interested in that. Um, I can make sure that my contact information um, is provided on the slides um, in addition. And so please reach out to me if you have ideas. What data, what digital services would you like to use that, the, that you know that the state has um, that, that could help us build these business models to provide better services? Great. Heather, thanks so much. I appreciate that. And uh, I'll be able to share the uh, slide deck as well as anything that you want to share with me uh, separately in an email. I can uh, push that out to the uh, to the audience afterwards. So thanks so much. That sounds good. Thank you. All right. And now we have Greta, are you on? I am on. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. We hear you fine. I'm just trying to set you up as presenter. And I, I think I've got All that. Right. Um, do you see anything? There we go. Okay. Good. Okay. So go ahead and. Uh... Okay. Bear with me for one second. Let's make sure I open up the right thing here. That looks pretty good. All right. Yep. We're starting to see you, so we know you. Okay. Okay. And <laughs> so uh, hold on a second. Get rid of it. Dialogue okay. box. So yeah, we see your screen and uh, go ahead. Just uh, just I haven't done any prep, so All just right. introduce yourself. <laughs> I will. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Doug and your staff for getting us connected, and I'm uh, very excited to be talking with the Smart Communities Forum for Alaska. So thank you all for attending and uh, you know spending the next 25 minutes or so with me. Um, I actually had the great pleasure of being in Alaska for the first time back in July, so my voice may be familiar because I was presenting at the State of Alaska and MSI SAC Joint Cybersecurity um, Conference, for lack of a better term, um, in July. So hello to anybody who recommends my name and voice, and uh, hello to maybe some future new members as well. So. Let me get into it because I know I don't want to go too much into your break time. I know how valuable that is. Um, but essentially, I'm from the MSI SAC. I'm going to talk in a lot of acronyms, so please call me out if I do not explain what an acronym means. Um, obviously, we're federally funded, so the government loves to make us use a lot of acronyms. Uh, but the MSI SAC stands for the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And we were actually designated by the Department of Homeland Security 
to provide free cybersecurity resources to help with cyber threat prevention, protection, response, and recovery. So I just want to key in on a term, free. Um, it's kind of nice to be able to give all of our services away. I do just want to say that it can own, um, because we're going to be from private industry, but I do have a couple things that I'm going to talk to you about as well that we can provide you uh, towards the end of the presentation. So um, I guess I'll kick things off here. Bear with me. There we go. So just to give you a little background on the MSI deck and how everything works, um, you notice from the past screen the term, or excuse me, the company Center for Internet Security. That is actually our parent company. And under the Center for Internet Security, or CIS, there's three different program areas that fall into uh, supporting the state, local, tribal, and territorial government. Um, we have the Elections Infrastructure ISAC. That's specifically for those that work directly for elections or from the IT side that supports elections. Um, and then on the other side, we have CIS Secure Suite. Um, I'll also mention the controls and benchmarks. Um, CIS Secure Suite benchmarks and controls can all be utilized by the SLTT community, but it can also be utilized by the private community. So that's one of those key resources I'll talk about in just a couple minutes. But what I really want to focus on today is that MSI SAC. Um, and again, this was designated by DHS, and it happened way back in the early 2000s. So a couple of states were working together, um, Florida, Texas, and New York State, and a lot of other Northeast states. And they were just sharing information on various cyber threats, and the federal government actually took notice and wanted to expand it across the United States. So originally it was really focused for just the states, and it's now moved into focusing um, in all levels of public entities and the government. So I can talk a little bit about who we serve now. Right now we're already working with all 50 states and six territories. We consider DC a territory, in case anybody's checking on my map. <laughs> um, we're working with 93 tribes across the United States, uh, 79 DHS recognized fusion centers. That, uh, the fusion centers is where those on the call who may not be aware what that is. It's actually a center where all levels of law enforcement, so I'm talking your local PD all the way up to FBI um, and some other similar agencies, they all get together and share information on physical threats as well as cyber threats within their state. So we are working with them very heavily on sharing information. But the number I really want to key in on is that 5,700 local government. It's actually more than that. Um, so what is the local government? That's basically any municipality, counties, cities. Um, it can also be school districts, higher education, such as community colleges, law enforcement agencies, airports, libraries. I think you're kind of getting the drift, hopefully. Um, and right now in Alaska, we're actually working with 41 different members. So we work with the state of Alaska very heavily. And we're also working with the various boroughs up there, uh, some of the cities and towns, the library association just signed out recently as well, some of the tribal entities. So we are very happy to be helping um, as much as we can with the state of Alaska and all the other municipalities within that. So again, I'm um, just gonna put this out there. You guys are free to go to this link at any time. I will also tell you, if you Google MSI staff registration, you're going to get this link. It's way easier than trying to write it down. <laughs> um, I will send this presentation out to Doug uh, so that he can also feel free to um, share the slides. So you know, don't worry about having to take too many notes. Um, but essentially, what we do, we're a membership organization. So what you have to do is just fill out a quick form. Um, you know, basic contact information, we have easy terms and conditions, and again, everything we do is at no cost because we receive federal dollars to do this. Um, and we'll do a quick vetting process, and then you're going to get passed over to our stakeholder engagement team who will basically take you through all of the steps. So for those of you who are already members, thank you. For those of you who fit in the SLTC um, arena, we hope that, you know, you take a look at this and become a member. Because we have a ton of services to offer you, again, at no cost. Um, the first thing I always like to highlight is we do have a true 24 by 7 security operations center. 
This is um, located in upstate New York, um, just outside the capital of Albany. That's where I'm calling in from today. And we have our security operations center in there. You can see the picture, it's a little bit more updated uh, currently, but we have a ton of analysts sitting on the floor and they are just, you know, they're busy working on all sorts of things like reporting and um, writing advisories and doing analysis, but in reality, they're waiting for you to call. So if you have any sort of questions, if you have any sort of, um, you know, experiencing an incident, something is wrong in your network, all I want you to get from this slide, honestly, is that phone number, the 866-787-4722. This is the most important thing I'll probably give to you throughout the presentation. It's the one thing that I really want to drive home. Make sure you have that. Put it on Post-it. Make sure your IT team has it. Um, because this is what we like to say, our get out of jail free card. It's those people you want to call when you're in trouble. So. Um, with anything, you know, cyber security related, we're more than happy to help you out. Within the cyber, uh, or excuse me, the SOC, Security Operations Center, we also have our CERT, which is our Computer Emergency Response Team. And what they really do, they're a small but mighty team, and they take care of all of our incident response. They also take care of, as you see, different types of analysis, different types of um, forensics and vulnerability assessments. Uh, one thing that I like to highlight on this slide, to be honest, is our computer network forensics. If you're ever experiencing an incident and want the digital forensics of what happened, how did it start, how did it get in, if you can locate patient zero and send that digital image to our team, they'll actually do a thorough review and send a report back to you with some recommendations for how to move forward in the future and also prevent this type of issue in the future. So again, I'm going to drive home that number, 866-787-4722. And if you're ever experiencing an incident, need some sort of request, you can always email as well. But as we all know, if anything was going on, you got hit by a phishing email, ransomware, what have you, you're going to want to talk to somebody immediately. So definitely call that number, and someone will be answering if it's 24 by this you. Another one of the great services that I think provides a lot of value, I've talked about this one, I could probably talk about the next four slides for 20 minutes, but I will, uh, <laughs> I'll save you the uh, pain of that. Um, but this is one of the easiest services to sign up for. When you become a member, you simply send in your public facing domains and IPs and send it over to our security operations center or the account manager that you're working with. And it's kind of a set it and forget it. You just sit back once you send that email and reap the rewards of having an entire team helping with monitoring of IPs and domains. On the IT side, we are looking for any signs of compromise, any signs of malicious activity. We work with a lot of different third parties. Um, for example, we work with Spamhouse. Um, this is actually a sinkhole hosting website, and we partner with them. They'll immediately alert us if we see, if they see any of our members. IT is beaconing out to think whole site. So that's really important because if that's happening, that means that there's some sort of malicious activity going on. On the domain side, we're keeping an eye on your credentials and making sure that, you know, your credentials, passwords, usernames don't end up in data dumps like the bad threat actors. Um, for instance, we work with Pastebin, and Pastebin is an actual legitimate site used by coders and developers. But threat actors also really like to utilize that and brag or dump credentials on there for sale. So we obviously keep an eye out for that because as we all know and hate to admit, um, our employees, our friends, our family love to reuse passwords. They also like to use their work credentials for things that are not related with work. Maybe it's an Amazon password or they sign up for a Target or Walmart account something of that nature, well, now they just possibly expose their work credentials as well. So we're always, you know, taking a deep dive. Our analysts are keeping an eye out for anything um, that looks fishy and immediately alerting our members if we see any .gov, .edu, .org um, being exploited. Within the IT and domain range monitoring, we also have two other vulnerability management programs. One is a web profiler and a port profiler. I just want to touch on this quickly. 
and get into the nitty gritty. But what is really valuable about this service is the web profiler is basically assisting with your patch management. So as we like to say, and I can't say that we coined this term because I've heard it before, but patch early, patch often. This web profiler is a great service that we provide. It's going to help remind you to patch early and patch often. It takes a look at, you know, various things such as your web programming language, content management system, et cetera. And we will alert you every month with anything that's out of date and anything that's up to date. We kind of give you that virtual high five, like you're doing well. Or else we're going to let you know when you're not doing well and maybe you missed the patch or you forgot to do an update to the newest version, what have you. Um, a lot of the malware and ransomware that's out there does get through because systems have not been patched correctly. So this is an incredibly important and easy service to use. On the port profiler side, this is where the MSI stack actually connects to 12 common ports on public IPs that you provide to us. The reason we do this is we want to see if we can find any ports that are open and publicly facing. I hate to admit it, but what we actually find a lot of are open printers and open RDP. So that means that it is open to the internet um, and somebody could, you know, utilize your remote desktop protocol. Definitely something we don't want to have happen. So we alert you on a quarterly basis with this and let you know, hey, here are the ports that are open to the public internet and here's what the port is behind them. So not only do we let you that they're open, but we're going to let you know what we can find behind them. And then it really is up to you to decide if you want to, that to remain open or closed. Close it up. So another great part of the ICM domain, um, just trying to help essentially keep your organization, you know, more secure. Okay. I know I can't see you all in the room, <laughs> but I bet that everybody has seen, received, or unfortunately um, had to deal with business email compromise or phishing. And this is a really great service that we provide, the Malicious Code Analysis Platform, or MCAP, where you get an account very easily by emailing the email on the screen, mcap at cisecurity.org. And all you do is email, get a quick account, and it allows you to actually um, upload executable URLs, documents, right into a sandbox environment. And the sandbox environment, you can see what would happen if you were to click on that attachment or click on that link. And you can determine yourself whether or not it was malicious. So I love this one. I actually use it personally. I think it's incredibly helpful. Um, this provides a great value. Again, we are always constantly receiving phishing emails and BEC compromise, and uh, this is a great way to protect against it. And again, another free service. It's your MSI back number. Two quick things I want to talk about that you're going to receive in your email. I just think these are valuable to cover. The first is the MSI back cyber alerts. Um, because a lot of what we do is information sharing and intelligence gathering, you to notice trends that are hitting various SLTT entities um, throughout our membership. We obviously, if we start seeing a trend, we're going to let everyone know that from statewide legal organizations. Once we started realizing it was hitting a couple of different organizations, we sent this out to all of our members and it has what's going on, what's happening, and then how, you know, what would happen if um, you get it. So there's recommendations on what to do to avoid this as well as um, you know what to look out for. So these, when you become a member, you start receiving cyber alerts, you're really going to make sure you open this email from us. As I mentioned, we have a lot of intelligence. Um, we work with, oh boy, various, um, we work with private industry, we work with the you know federal government, FBI, uh, all sorts of different agencies and other ISACs. And we have a lot of intelligence. We write on a lot of intel, intel papers. But I just want to highlight on this slide for time's sake, it's a situational awareness report. This is going to come out every month. And it's a really great retrospective on you know, the various steps of the threats and trends that we've seen over the last 30 days. Um, so this is kind of going to let you know what to keep an eye out for, what is hitting different organizations, and you know, really how to protect yourselves as well. We also send out, as you can see, different primers, um, 
all sorts of white papers, et cetera. But I would suggest when you start receiving emails from us, cyber alerts, situational awareness reports, as far, and then advisory, so I'll talk about briefly as well. Those are the things that I want to immediately. Um, one program that we run is a nationwide cybersecurity review. Why I want to talk about this today is because the NCSR actually opens up, I believe, in September or October, and it is a fantastic self-assessment. And what it really provides is a baseline of your gaps and your capabilities of your organization when it comes to cybersecurity. And it's a really great way to look year, you know, year to year of where you need to grow, where you are growing, where you're succeeding, and how do you actually match up with others in your sector. So if you work in a city or a borough or a school district or a tribe, you can anonymize, be able to see as a whole how that sector is doing and how you compare. Again, I do want to stress that this is totally anonymous. Um, any data that is all compiled, um, we do it by sector, but it is anonymous. So you don't get to see anybody else's scores, which I think is important, because you want to be really truthful with yourself when you do this report. But again, as a member, you'll receive emails about this over the next couple of weeks. So I'll alert you that it's coming out. And for those of you that do join after today, you'll be seeing this as well in the next couple of weeks. So as I mentioned, um, a lot of the resources that I just, all the resources actually that I just talked about are only for MSI best eligible members. So that's in your state, local, tribal government. Um, but we do have resources that we can share with private organizations as well. Private organizations and MSI SEC members can also request to receive the MSI SEC advisory. And these advisories are great because they're for known vulnerabilities and they're delivered on an ad hoc basis. What we're looking for with these vulnerabilities are high criticality levels that would allow for you know, things like arbitrary remote code execution, escalation of privileges, essentially we're looking for things that could really damage um, a network or a system. We don't send things that are not really applicable um, to government and business. And we will definitely let you know if this vulnerability is exploited in the wild, if whether or not there's a risk to government or business. So again, these come out on an ad hoc basis, but with your private industry, you're more than welcome to receive these. You would just sign up through the membership link that I will show at the end of the slide again, um, and just let them know that you just want to be put on the public distribution list. MSI SEC members and private industry can also utilize our monthly newsletter. This newsletter is uh, created by our education awareness work group. And what we think is good for is really util uh, excuse me, really creating your own cybersecurity program. Um, but this is all written in plain language, end user language, and it's actually more for um, like personal cybersecurity. So think about how to sh uh, shop safely online. Um, this one is common IT wisdom. We do one, you know, how to avoid a W2 scam. These are really good at getting people to think about cybersecurity in their own world, in their personal world at home. And then hopefully if you can get people to think about being cyber secure at home, we'll bring that mentality into work as well, which would make a lot of people's lives easier. Um, and just one more thing on the highlight, it is distributed in template form. You can actually steal our words. You can put our name, your name, it came from the desk of, you know, Doug Miller, um, and then you wrote this and to distribute it at will to your association. So again, this is available to everybody that's on the call today. Um, Stay Safe Online is actually not through the MSI SAC, but it's something that we work very heavily with the National Cybersecurity Alliance. So I do like to share this slide just because I think it's valuable for those in the SLTT world, but also for those in the private industry and business world. Um, it just has really great tip sheets, there's a small business toolkit, a lot of different um, topics of conversation like securing key devices. And it just gives a lot of advice if you don't know where to start or if you just need to help um, train. It also works really well for uh, school districts because there's a lot of resources for teachers, things of that nature. So this is a really great site to just check out and see how you can utilize it for yourself. All right, and one of the last things, I know I'm going over my time just a bit here, but 
One of the last things that I wanted to talk about is actually the CIS security. So remember that first slide that I had, you know, began to talk about how CIS is the umbrella, one of the program areas is the MSI staff and the other is CIS security. Well, the CIS security actually leverages the CIS benchmarks and the CIS controls. For those of you on the tech side, you may have heard of the uh, SAMS Top 20 many years ago. It's now been the CIS uh, critical controls. Now it's just the CIS controls. Um, but essentially, it leverages these benchmarks and controls with a host of cybersecurity tools to automate configuration, assessment, and provide enhanced insight for organizations. So what does that all mean? Essentially, um, anyone on the call, MSI staff members, you get this at no cost. Private industry, there is a cost. Don't be mad. I can tell you, CIS is a nonprofit 501c3. So all of our services are at a cost recovery model. So we tend to be a little bit more, you know, cost effective than some other vendors. Not to knock any of them, but. <laughs> um, you can sign up and request a quote for CIS Secure Suite. And what it says is when you do become a member, it's going to give you access to the CIS Workbench, which is going to be where we host all those controls and benchmarks and tools such as SysCap Pro. Um, for in, like SysCap Pro is an amazing tool where it's a configuration and vulnerability assessment tool. And it really allows you to take a look at your configurations and set them up to be more cyber secure. If you get a Windows 10 machine out of the box, it's set up for ease of customer use. That's not always the most secure, so you would want to take a look at some of these different benchmarks and really assess, um, get that machine up and running so it's more cyber security focused as opposed to customer ease. Um, again, with the Secure Suite, this is available to all MSI tech members at no charge. And for the private industry in the room, feel free to contact us. I can connect you with a team that um, can tell you more about CIS Secure Suite and how you can utilize it. Uh, what I want to say is we have a ton more services, a ton more written products. Uh, I didn't want to bore you to death today, so I wanted to um, be careful with my time and hit really the most valuable tools that I think the MSI staff can provide immediately. Um, so again, who do you call? Remember this number, 866-787-4722. That's it, 24 by 7 number. And if you are interested in joining the MSI staff, again, it's a quick form, no cost involved. And you just simply go to this link here for Google MSI staff registration and find that. Um, find that link and fill out the information. Um, and just quickly, I just want to highlight again, um, I'm Brenda Noble, Senior Program Specialist, been here for just shy of two years. Um, and I also work heavily with Brendan Montaigne. He is my partner, and we actually cover the state of Alaska, Hawaii, all of the West Coast and the territory. So we are your go-to people. If you have any sort of questions, any needs, um, Basically, anything. Come to us first. If we don't have an answer, we're going to get it for you. So with that, I just want to say thank you all for listening. If anybody has a quick question before break, please feel free to ask. And um, Doug and your team, thank you once again. Appreciate it, everyone. Yeah, Brenda, thanks so much. I, I do have a quick question. So you mentioned 41 entities that are members right now in Alaska. Do you happen to know which one is the smallest one yes. by, by uh, population? I suppose that's a town or a village, perhaps. Do you know? Yeah. Uh, just off the top yeah, of your head. Oh was... my god. Off, off the top of my head, I gotta say, um, is it the city of Soldatna? Am I saying that right? Yep. yep. Um, they're a member. <laughs> oh, jeez. That's okay. You probably uh, know. Most of us fish in that yeah. town, too. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> so yeah, we have a couple of the cities. I know Kenai, Sudatna, um, and I know drive me crazy. I thought you were up there. We got to... okay. No, I know, I know. I think we talked and it could be as few as well, what would be the smallest uh, I mean like 10, 20 population I think where you and I maybe chatted about, you know, so it's being a free service and then subscribe. Yeah. So I mean, there's no, there's a real small entity can be able to subscribe to the service. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I know that one of my coworkers went down to Healy, 
and was working with them and needs to become a member. Um, yeah, and we're, you know, it's, it, we can help smallest to, you know, the largest population. So whatever services that you can utilize, we can help with. So I guess my main point is we got a bunch, you know, hundreds of villages, right, smaller entities, right? Um, and a lot of folks we talked about earlier, no one can, very few in Alaska can afford the size of IT platform and so forth. So work with the boroughs, but even as a village level, right. um, can subscribe to the service, the interpretation of those words that might need some help. So I, I look at this as with the cyber attacks that have happened, my, my mind kind of goes to kind of closing ranks, mm -hmm. consolidation of, and, and developing a common knowledge, perhaps through this forum and other ways. We had this conference three, three weeks ago here in, in Alaska, um, is uh, we, we can't work in a silo. So uh, you know, towns within a borough, exactly. and even with the boroughs working with the state, I know Eric's working with the new security officer, Mark Brunig, at the state uh, security level. Mark's uh, setting up a new security operations center for the state. I know there's been starts, fits and starts over the years, but looks like he's got a lot of traction. He's got several people that, that are uh, on his team and, and building out that team, along with a platform for doing some of the helping out a smaller entity, uh, like even with Matthew Burrow looking at the log data, working through the state's platform. So he's, he's working through a couple different models about how that service right is going to work. Um, and then I'll get some more information. I ping Mark, but uh, uh, he provided an update, uh, well, three weeks ago, obviously, presented three months ago at this forum. But I'll get some of the more of the latest about who to call, but you're not out there alone. And that was the message three weeks ago, is there's no, no need to go this alone. Even as a private entity, yes, the utility is what your local borough that you're headquartered in is doing, or what your local state uh, our security office is doing. Real, real important that we're not isolated. And then this is a great service to be able to try out. Maybe really quick, you know, you have a SOC. Um, state is going to have a SOC. Um, there are SOCs provided by uh, other vendors throughout the country and the world. Um, how would you say, other than, uh, other than, other than, I guess, free, right? Is is there a is there a, a slight what would you can how how would you differentiate your sock to say a large vendor um, or to another state uh, security operations center? Sure, I think um, it, one of the things that you know it, with, that we differentiate is um, I know some of the larger vendors do things like managed security services. That is not something that our SOC you know, can provide, unfortunately, at this time. Um, we're really there for information gathering, information sharing, uh, advisories, things of that nature. And to be honest with you, a lot of the organizations that we work with already do have, um, you know, started up their own stock. And for what we become is additional support for that second set of eyes. Um, so I can't sit here and say, hey, we're going to be able to solve everything. But when you need that second opinion or you need somebody to answer that phone because you just have a question or, you know, you're in mid-panic of an incident, um, it's knowing that you always kind of have that backbone. Um, we are definitely working with the state of Alaska. I know uh, Mark has some great plans. And we're going to share all of our information that we can with him which means that anybody who's working with his stock is already going to have our information. So some of the intel that we get is uh, declassified federal information um, that we receive through our partners that other stocks may not have. So that is probably one differentiating thing that we may be receiving that others aren't. But our ultimate goal is to share that information. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Greta. Any last uh, questions? All right, we got your contact information. I do have the deck, Greta, so if that's the deck, then I can go ahead and post that to our community right. forum site. And uh, thanks again so much. Yes. Right. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Take care. Um, so, everyone, take 10 minutes. Um, we got the bathrooms down through the, uh, to the lobby there, and we have some more snacks here for yourselves. And then, uh, for those of you who are staying, we have lunch showing up in the lobby about 11:30, 11:45. So, uh, but we have Sharon Stanley here in about 10 minutes. All right, thanks. Yeah. How much the kitchen remodel gone? Oh.
Are you done? No, no one ever heard. To our northwest of uh, downtown Atlanta. Um, and she's been a known speaker for the last, I think, two years. Um, and uh, I learned about Sharon through Eric. Eric was participating in a, in a conference, a uh, public services conference uh, in California a few months ago, uh, sponsored by Esri. Uh, so in any event, uh, we want to be able to share uh, what uh, Sharon and her teams have been leading in Cobb County. Uh, so with that, Sharon, I have everybody here. We have about uh, 30, 35 folks in the room, and just to give you, I think, a little bit of background, uh, state local government, um, uh, utilities, uh, and consulting companies make up the, the, the large part of the, the group here. A lot of the folks are familiar faces from uh, prior forums. We've been running the forum for quarterly for about three and a half years now. So, uh, and we often like to be able to have somebody uh, out of state. Uh, this really shouldn't share from a state or a county or city level uh, what you are doing. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Fantastic. And I got a little bit of laryngitis, so if I get too um, low, just let me know, okay? Um, but first, I just want to thank you for inviting me to Brown Church and um, Alaska Smart Dream Forum. I love talking about what's going on with the um, IT in Cobb County and what we're doing in digital transformation, so I uh, was really excited when Eric asked me if um, I would join the forum and, and, and kind of tell you a little bit about where, where we're going and what we've been doing. So, as Doug said, um, you know, we are northwest of Atlanta. Basically, we're about 755,000 citizens, and that makes us the third most populated, you know, city in our county in Georgia. And what's unusual you'll see up here is although we're landlocked, no beaches, you know, mountain ranges, our number one economic driver in, in Cobb County is tourism. Um, we have the most visited battlefield based on a Civil War um, event or war site in, in the country. So it's a lot there. We, we have a lot of recreation in the county, a lot of communication going on there. We also have our international airport, although we're located near one of the busiest airports in the country, Hartsville, Jackson, and Atlanta. We have our own international airport which actually had about 900 um, arrivals and departures during you know, the, the Super Bowl this year. So we're kind of, um, we, we do a lot on Twitter, but we have three major league teams that call Cobb County home. And that drives a lot of the tourism and what we end up doing in Cobb County. An interesting fact, though, is that more, that affects my digital transformation a little bit more, is that the U.S. Census Bureau actually ranks Cobb County as, well, as the most educated in the state of Georgia and among the top 12 in the nation. Um, that's important to me for a big reason when it comes to digital transformation. Our citizens are, are basically technologically savvy, and they expect their local government to give them the same level of convenience that they experience day to day when they walk into any business here in Cobb County. But at the same time, they expect me, as most government organizations uh, are expected to do, to keep our costs low and their tax rates low. So, we kind of have been undergoing our digital transformation for about the last three to five years. A little background, I got here about, um, I got here five years ago, came from private industry, um, came into Cobb County, love it. But some of the guiding principles, when I first got here, I, heard, I want to talk a little bit about smart communities. I would say, people say, well, what about a smart county? You know, what are you doing to become a smart county? And I'll be honest, it was, it was a little hard at the beginning of the discussion because everyone associated smart cities smart communities with IoT devices. And when you don't have control over parking garages, those are our municipalities in this area, or you don't have a lot of areas where, um, you know, we're not trying to park cars, we don't collect trash, you know, we don't do any of the things where you have a lot of IoT devices, I had to really think, does the county play a role in that? So I've kind of changed my view on what a smart community is and I think IoT is certainly a part of it. You'll see we're very engaged in that area when it comes to our traffic management and our signaling in the county. But I think we need to understand that also, I mean, for me, a smart community is one. We kind of put some of our guiding principles. It's one where I wanted to build a culture where our, our agency heads, everybody in the county were basically made, were able to and wanted to make data-driven decisions. So I wanted to establish that culture. But we also wanted to make our services and our data available to our citizens and businesses in the county 
24 hours a day, any device, anytime, anywhere. Um, so I kind of changed our view of what, you know, smart and digital transition, you know, transformation was. I think we've left out in some of our discussions that application layer and the things that applications can actually do to make um, areas, you know, areas in the county more, where we use IT to facilitate and um, and make, make more um, transparent our business services. So we already have the GIS platform, and I spent a little bit of time, so you'll see a lot of the things we use are based on the GIS platform. We already had the GIS platform, so when we decided to do this, that was the perfect platform for us to start doing that data sharing, the, that um, decision making, using analytics. It was the perfect platform for us. Um, and what essentially you'll see that we got our location services, and GIS is not our only platform, but we used those since we already had it in all of the departments to pretty much engage our constituents, both our citizens and our businesses, um, for collaboration across our departments because our departments were much more willing to share data through GIS if we put it on there than they were to just say another department has full access to my data. Um, and also, we, we brought in a lot of smart decision making through some analytics, some big data, some BI tools that we brought in. And another area of the location intelligence has helped us with um, is executive support for our digital transformation. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later because I think that's a key element. You can't do um, you, you can't be successful in digital transformation and building a smart community unless you have the support of the top level. So I want to talk a little bit about that as we kind of go along. Um, so in, in Cobb County, this is one thing I want to talk about. We, we, you'll hear, if you go to any of our board meetings, you'll hear our commissioners say transparency, sharing of data, um, things like you know, citizen to government um, communication. And so we use and build a lot of tools similar to this one, where we've actually, this was, if you, if you are one of the government agencies in the room, you know, that getting a tax increase or millage rates is what we call it for us, increase is almost impossible. Well, the chairman came to us about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and requested us to help him with communicating his message out to the citizens and the businesses in the county of what a millage rate would do both how it would affect them and how it would affect the services and what they would get additional. So we built basically a smart tool for the citizens where they could not only go in and see his message about what millage rate he proposed, what he was going to add to the services, whether that be Sunday library hours or more police, but, but because there was a great concern about what that going to do to my taxes, we were able to build and link this to our actual um, tax system where a citizen could go in get their own property, we use a sliding millage rate bar and pretty much figure out exactly what it was going to do to their, their taxes the next year. Now, because we have what, what's called a homestead um, rule here in God County, most of them were only affected $100 or $200. So when they bought all the services they would get compared to what they would have to pay additional, we actually, long story short, millage rate passed. Um, lots of the services we had had to during the heat downturn in the economy um, ceased providing, we were able to add back. So so I, th I think this, I consider this a smart community because it also allowed us to interact with the citizens. They actually can also take surveys and I was able to show my district to the commissioners who had to vote for the millage rate increase. How many of their citizens were for, how many of their citizens were against um, the millage rate increase. Um, all the way down to where we have a public GIS portal, and I won't do a lot on showing this, but primarily because of the fact that it, um, we're getting ready to upgrade this to the hub, which will provide us an additional capability to say, should we say, let's say we found a, a, a sister community in, or, um, in Alaska who wanted to share um, our data of some type. You can actually have a privileged shared relationship in our new hub where you can, where you can see the data that the citizens can't. Um, or if we did that with a business or health department or something. So we're upgrading this, um, you know, this, this as well. So I think that um, uh, the next thing I want to kind of do for you is, so we've gone beyond that sharing, only just being able to share the data with the citizens. We've actually gotten where we can take that data, take and interact, you know, with the citizens, whether it be a smart device or not. This is where I want to talk about this. Smart devices don't have to be um, smart, 
but I mean, don't have to be actually computerized. We actually feel like now we're taking those location intelligence information to the citizens right where they live, work, and play. I'm going to show you a short video, but to tell you what this is, to me, that's a smart device. That's a sign. So that's a smart device because that links behind it to the application in our agency, and you're going to see what it, what it does. But this was a collaborative project between my, our IS team, um, Public Safety 911, um, the emergency, um, emergency, emergency um, response agency, DOT, and PARC. So this was an area where we basically were able to coordinate between all the departments, and that sign, once that number comes into a 911 call, is a smart device um, for our public safety. So I'm going to start the video. If it does not work, um, I'm going to turn it over to Doug and let him start it for you. I need to make sure you hear sound if I start it.
And I'm going to people say, oh, go ahead and it, show them and shut down that lab. Well, this one was a true snow projection. We put several feet and it really did. And then a layer of ice on top and it really did shut us down. Um, and then this is one, you know, never, you know, kind of never before we had access to the amount of data. Our county's been around a long time and we've got tons of data um, that we really have not been able to totally use. But data in itself doesn't really do anything for me. I need to get information out of that. So one of our goals of our, our digital transformation has been to provide dashboards or tools that facilitate data sharing and allow the agencies to collaborate to solve problems. So what you see here is a dashboard that we created for fire um, and a black dot for the stuff because those are names. So this provides real time, it's live. Um, this is something that used to be done by three officers in a room that had to be tied up from actually working on fire engines to sit in a room, plot where all the fire trucks were, um, plot where all the um, emergency life equipment was, close to the station, and try to figure out whether they had coverage in every, every location. We created this and added even additional information for them, which provides real-time data. But this is linked in with our, our ABL system, which is our automatic vehicle location system. So the location of every emergency unit, including the ambulances that we work with in the private sector, are actually on this. But the, the real intelligence of this for the higher level in fire is if you look at those circles surrounding those stations, they each mean something. You know, if it turns red, it's going to tell them that we have no coverage in that area. Um, and if it turns blue, it tells them another thing about another kind of equipment that you have. Like you have no, um, you know, jaws of life or you never have no um, emergency um, medical response team at those. So this basically was something that we built and collaborated with the agency. And then during the Super Bowl, um, the Super Bowl, we actually took and updated that and added the PD incident to it, but also built another dashboard that allowed them to track their officers as they were down in Atlanta. Because during the Super Bowl, Cobb had a lot of activity going on. You see in the left, um, up the left, top left, we created the dashboard there to actually show them all activities happening in Cobb. So they would know which bars had parties going on, um, those kind of things, just which which hotel had, had team members or major events um, going on at that time. But the tracker okay, the tracker was a new application for us because the chief of police came to me and said, I'm gonna have officers down in Atlanta, we're lending them to Atlanta. You know, when they're here in the county, I have radio contact with them. Via the radios, I know where they're at, but I don't know where these officers will be in Atlanta, they'll be further from my officers to be able to provide a system. I want to know where every one of them is um, when they're working in the Super Bowl. So we created this, you know, this for them um, to use during that time. But and, and then I want to go back to this because what I thought was really what I thought was great about this. My goal, our goal, is that to get away from where we have to build everything for the department and and, and suggest to them what they share. You saw the dashboard before this from where we built it for fire. In this instance, the team got together themselves, coordinated what they wanted, and we only came in and helped here when it had to do with, they, they hit a, a glitch in the application where they did not know how to make something they wanted to do happen. So to me, that was a big success on our part because with the digital you know, transformations we was involving, not just my IT team anymore, but now I've got departments and agencies who are sharing their own data and building collaborative dashboards. And, and that was one of our goals as we decided, that if we, you look at our digital transformation goals, was to have that happen. Um, one of the other areas where we have done a lot um, was in the area of community design. You know, these, basically you'll see here that in 2013, been, and those of you who have never been to Atlanta, the Atlanta Braves announced that they were going to move from Atlanta proper and in turn field and move to this on the left, you see, well, for me it's left, the 50 acre tract of land in Cobb County, which is great for us, but they announced that they were going to, the stadium was going to be completed by their first game in 2017, a short 30 months later, um, which is a huge undertaking. But to make it even more interesting, they threw in the building of a small city in parallel. So this was going to be a multi-use area where they were going to build 
basically apartment buildings. They were going to build stores around it. You can see that in the picture on the left. Um, for us to have been able to do that, we essentially, I don't think that it's the most aggressive private public partnership in Cobb County's history. Um, I don't think I'm sure that we could have ever done that without the efficiency and intelligence of the location platforms we use to automate processes, um, visually display the areas they were looking at, automate permitting, inspection, and most of you I think probably have that automated, but back in 13, we were just in the beginning stages of that. So the bottom line was, this is one of the most, um, it, it, it pretty much became, we were able to facilitate one of the most ambitious build projects of Major League Baseball history without compromising any of our regulations and permitting requirements. And we did that um, through what I consider um, digital transformation or smart communities. During that time, you'll see here, we also built, um, it's a very complicated product, so we built 3D modeling for the county. First time we had ever done that, but this project brought us in where we, we felt that we needed to have a way, if you see here, a very complicated area on the right. Um, this is just a, a, a more detailed view of what's on the left. This allowed us, those lines you see on there, this allowed public safety to use this to come up with their traffic plan, their emergency route. Um, the goal in this was to basically, um, if you look at the next slide, well, this is the next one. They go back to the, so the goal in here was to get get everybody seated in the first before first pitch and get everybody out in 45 minutes, which is a pretty aggressive um, project because this plot of land runs between three interstates. It's basically a triangle of three interstates that all come off and on into that area. Um, another community development area that, that we used at our 3D modeling for recently, one of the commissioners came to me and said, I really, really wish and this is way better on the touch screen, but that I really, really wish I could see this project that the vendor is proposing, the shopping center in my district. They want to cut down all the trees because they say that citizens can see this better from the road and see the signage. I don't believe that's true. I'd like to see what this area looks like um, with the trees gone. So we built a 3D model for her that she could essentially go to any area in it, see what it looked like with the trees, without the trees and not be outdone in the community development, also even added an area where she could see the shadows of the trees where they were at different times of day. Um, I already spoke a little bit about the Braves project. I wanted to talk to continue, that's become one of our most, our most aggressive um, economic business areas in the county. So we've had, so we have continued with developing things there. And I wanna talk a little bit about our traffic management plan. So, I mentioned data-driven decisions and the 3D modeling. What this allowed us to do here was to essentially provide, um, this is J.D. Lawrence, he's the traffic officer down at the stadium um, who works for Cobb County, but he was able to design a traffic plan, but as you see, the areas are very busy when you're going to be in the stadium area. He needed a plan that pretty much told his officers where every column had to be placed for every game. Um, and this gave them that. You'll look here um, on the picture on the right, that's a pedestrian bridge where the game gets out. A large percent of the, um, the pedestrians going um, south come out over that bridge and mix um, with traffic. That's the picture you see down on the bottom here. So it was great. JD learned how to control intelligence that's built into the camera where they actually see how many cars are in, in each portion of the intersection and change that and that's and cars that adaptive traffic management system was designed for cars. So JD quickly learned how he could move something. and that's what you see at the bottom there. These are these are roads coming off of the interstate, but you have at that end and when he was at the game it, it was wonderful and we had the game cleared in forty five minutes after the game was over, which was great. But when JD was gone um, we had officers who didn't do it on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we had there is we built for him using our artificial intelligence, our industry platform, a, a dashboard that would essentially show the pedestrian movement and because it's different on whether we're losing or whether we're winning, but would show when that pedestrian movement came and hit the threshold of when we should start blocking traffic in all four ways at this intersection and allowing pedestrians, using his officers, 
and allowing pedestrians to move diagonally to get to the parking areas on that side. Um, so, so it was a tool we provided for him. We were able to do that because we have a pretty advanced, this is one area where ISD does play into our digital transformation strategy. Our um, traffic management center, in my opinion, and of course I'm prejudiced, is um, one of the most advanced in the state, if not in the East Coast. Um, this is our large traffic management center. We have a mini traffic management center that duplicates this, which is built down at the stadium and during game day or events like concerts. That, tra that area takes over from this traffic management center. It's still connected. So they have people who sit in that traffic management center and actually um, watch for things and, and assist the police JD in that area with controlling traffic and pedestrians. You know, um, we also have a little advantage. We're, we're a ways connected community. So we're able to, I think I should have on the other slide, sorry. We're a ways connected community, which actually allows us um, to receive data. We brought in a big data platform last year. NGIS, which allows us to receive data from Waze and to provide them with authoritative accident and traffic information. So it, it works well for both both us and Waze um, with that. That's another project that we, we ran. And I'm just, that's kind of, a, I'm going through these. One, one thing is our traffic management center, but this is another area where data and um, becoming a smart community played a big role for us. We have a lot, lot, lot of traffic and accident data, crash data for the county. It was an overwhelming amount um, to do manually and to go in and figure out what were the causes of crashes. Um, so what we did is partnered with Esri and actually added the layer to our traffic um, GIS layer, which actually included slopes, you know, included values for slopes and curves, and added to that the GIS layer when you examine the traffic um, accidents that have occurred over the last 10 years. So what it allowed us to do was find those where if we spend dollars on um, various things, whether that be guardrails or changing the slope of the road or putting anti-friction um, surfaces on, we were able to, our dollars, like most of yours, I would imagine, are limited in how much we can spend on paving or road updates and projects. This allowed us to target those zones. We're doing more than that with an app, but this is the first thing we did with that big data platform to be able to look at that data. Um, and then this one is another dashboard that we just recently created. And this one is, is still in development, but this is where I want to show this example. You don't have to do big, great things um, to make, you know, to be digital, you have to have a digital transformation in your account. You know, we started, if you saw back at that slide early in the beginning, just showing fire, what events they had, and where all their cars and uh, where all their fire trucks and um, rescue vehicles were, and then turning the, their, their stations a color based on some rules that we put into there that had to do with when areas weren't covered. And this is the latest thing that we've been looking at. Now public safety and DOT are actually talking about sharing data for some of the first time, because public safety is always coming after us do this, do this, and I'm kind of, the already has way better data. But we actually now, through these dashboards, they saw last week what um, DOT was able to do here and add a layer of traffic cameras and management. So now public safety is actually, we've got to sanitize some areas, and that's what those white areas are. I apologize for that, but their names there. So that when there is an accident on a highway or on a road where PD is involved and they have lanes closed, now the traffic management center will actually get data that says, hey, there's an accident here. We already have the accident, but we don't know what lanes they closed or any of that. They'll be able to call up those traffic management signals. They'll be able to actually read, you know, divert traffic based on what's happening, and they'll be able to clear it more quickly because they'll know when the lanes have been back back open. And that was great. DOT asked us for that. This was already developed for police. But when we showed it to police and fire last week, um, they immediately saw the value of this for themselves, which is to when things are occurring, this is a very high level, but you can zoom in and pretty much see who's inside a window um, at a bank almost. So they saw the value of this to be able to use this and actually go to camera.
cameras if they have something happening um, or a crime reported in the area. And um, DOT is looking at giving them control of the cameras during those times so they can um, point the traffic cameras in that direction. So. But DOT and, um, and DOT and public space are not the only area where data and um, digital transformation has been occurring. I mentioned earlier the thing that thrills me the most is that our agencies and departments and non-technical users have started becoming technical users of data. In this sense, the young lady you see up here in the left-hand corner is she was at Senior Services and she was a public health specialist. She went to one class, um, one of my GIS teams offered all the new analytics tool that by then, then was new, now is no longer new, and was and saw that it could do so much for her. So she built um, dashboards for senior services, which actually could enhance the lives of senior adults. Um, this, these you see here, she built dashboards that show um, where citizens, it's not just citizens is what we found, where seniors were coming from to all of the different senior centers throughout the county. One way that helped her took the senior um, services director tremendously was you had one district that had no um, senior services center. So in any finance conversation that came up on that, they saw no reason to approve anything for those centers. But we were able with this to show them that a large population of their district uses the senior centers across the line. Um, and travel to the senior centers. And I don't go into describing what it all is, but it's basically analytics. It'll show you, you'll see some centers have people who come from all over, some centers have people who come from local, but we are also able to look at and say, you know, we'd like to target, we don't have, we don't have many men coming to seniors, so we have fewer, fewer men than your adults who come. So you're able to look at activities that are more popular, activities that are more popular among men, et cetera. Um, so you'll see one of these charts, you'll see this, um, we were able to see that um, at one of the senior centers, one of the events was way, way more popular than some of the others. And if you look at it and can see it from there, which you probably cannot, it was day, tomorrow, and always happy class. Um, so yeah, that was a very successful event for their West Coast Senior Center. So, but basically, you can see they were able to analyze a lot of data. Um, with that. And then seniors have just become, it's funny because I'm going to, as you roll out the tools and expose your agencies and your, or your departments and your businesses to the tools for, for digitization or digital transformation and sharing and analyzing data, I will, I will tell you ahead of time, be prepared because now there's a hunger for anything that we can do to automate processes or automate services or allow them more data to make better decisions with. So after the previous project role, this year seniors have decided that transportation is one of their issues. They would love to see our digital transformation strategy and, and, and program help them solve that problem. So they have fixed routes and demand routes. They run about 20 routes daily. Um, I was the slow part on this because I truly thought they had three bands, but when I met with the director and found out they had 32 different bands and routes, then it was, a, it was a large problem. So I thought, well, we definitely need to solve that. So essentially, their old way of doing business was stick pins on a, on a, on a board, uh, a route sheet that essentially did a paper sheet over here that kept track, the drivers, had no navigation, they used their own personal phones. If they needed to communicate back with seniors or the other bus drivers, they used radio. So what they have today is essentially a transportation 2.0 platform that we built for them that not only shows them where every vehicle is with ADL, but does automatic routing. Um, we built a little bit of intelligence into it where it takes a fixed route, knows where it's gotta go, but it's also adaptable so if someone calls and says, I need to go to the doctor, I didn't report this, but I've all of a sudden I've got an emergency appointment I've got to make, they can actually plug it in and give them who's closest, which route's better. Um, and the, and we put tablets into the hands of the drivers, and not other drivers, but so that when they get there, they can actually plug in, Mrs. Jones wasn't here today. So it also provides information back to the senior center, they may say, or, you know, Mrs. Jones didn't come to the door, 
where somebody can check on what's in your adult um, with those. So we're going to actually be rolling this out further. Senior, uh, um, and usually we're the first ones to use this and develop it, but now we see way more uses. We've got community development and our um, they're permitting as well as some of our DOT areas that want to um, adapt something similar to this for the automatic automated grounding portions of it. Um, and this basically tells you now where the drivers before had used their personal phones. That's actually what got me engaged. I have a, a, a program manager and um, who actually sits over in the um, and manages the senior services area for their IT. And he came to me and said, you know these drivers are using their own personal phones to try to call up waves or whatever. So um, we now have on their tablets wave integration. So that they can use there. So. Um, and then this I want to talk a little bit, because this is where I said this was pretty much close to the end, where I said I think it's very critical. Um, because our GIS platform was used throughout the county, and it's a very visual platform, it allowed us to gain executive support. We actually spoke out for 2018 as international user cops. This is just to show you how successful that um, support from the agencies has become. We basically at that conference had you know, the chief of police, the director of public safety, the county commissioner with, and five other department directors. The next year, we, the remainder of the department agency directors in the county wanted to go, and that's where you're gonna see some of the applications. It'll come out over the next year. So they're not always using ESRI, but they come back with ideas of what can be automated. Um, it has actually been so successful for us we have one commissioner who wants to build his own application. Um, so this was actually, he learned the, one of our um, GIS platforms and built an application that allows him to go throughout the county, mark every road in his district that he has visited, and um, mark whether he sees a pothole or he sees damage to the road, and it has been linked in with the DMT ticketing system. Um, and then I want to just, this is what's next. Um, one area I didn't target on, I think why digital transformation is important and all these, these things that the county has available to citizens now, this is that bunch of park area. Why these are so important is that smart communities attract smart businesses. Um, what you see in this picture is, is a simulated drawing of the Keystone Cross building, which is coming down to the, um, the SunTrust Park area. Um, and that is their, their facility where all of their new technology for elevators will be tested. And whether that's elevators that go side to side, Elevators that go up and down, um, you know, elevators, high speed elevators. All, that's their smart facility that will be doing that. So we also have the Comcast, and that's actually one of the buildings in this suit that you see next to the stadium um, right here. The Comcast has their, um, and I forgot what they call their center, I apologize, but their, their center where they bring in new businesses and new technology to, to sponsor them and allow them to roll out. Um, new, new products, and then and then we have others down in this area as well. But but it, it also drives economic development. This area, if you have looked at, you saw that dirt area. This is what it looked like. And we had no high-rise office buildings in that area for the last 15 years. We have had five that we brought the the, the SunTrust Park in area and started automating a lot of the traffic. The nice thing about the SunTrust Park in SunTrust Park area is the traffic management programs we put in place are there 365 days of the year. There are not that many games. Um, so so it, it, the citizen benefits from this at other times. So when I say what's next, um, there's a lot coming from that we, we're planning as far as indoor mapping to allow me to potentially map this building so the buyer will know, you know, we don't support that. You know, that's going to be the, the highest building in Cal, but one of the top 30 or 40 in, in Atlanta, our fire department, you know, doesn't fight that, that kind of fire. So we're looking at indoor mapping and augmented reality and our digital transformation of system and things like that. Um, we're looking at, as I said earlier, the hub. But frankly, what next is anything now that we've got our departments and agencies on board and realizing how much value that, that smart technology or digitization of their, their services and data can provide to them, it's whatever they ask for. Um, that, that is supported by you know, the business case. 
Um, and that's kind of a quick run through of some of the digital, um, you know, the smart community and the um, projects that we rolled out in our digital strategy over the last year, year and a half. Um, I'm excited about where it's going. So. That's great. Uh, Sharon, thanks so much. Um, I know we're a little bit short on time, but I mean, uh, uh, questions? Yep. Hey, Sharon, this is uh, Eric White from uh, Madison Pearl. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation today. I find it uh, uh, fascinating and, and really happy to uh, have this presented at our smart communities here. I know in uh, Balmer, I, we'd love to put up a high rise like this. Maybe we'd go for three stories. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the face can't turn on that. Well, I have found to get notes, okay. <laughs> Hello, I have a question. So when you're sharing the technology yeah. across the different divisions and departments and other organizations, are you including them? within your organization? Is that how you're sharing out uh, the technology to them? With, through our JS online? The way we're organized? Well, that's part of, part of the way, yes. So the way we're organized, um, IT and top is centralized. So all of the IT basically in the county, whether it be rolling out the body cameras or putting you know the police car cameras in or supporting them that broke down the road, the DOT technology all the way to supporting you know, so the cash systems um, and for tax, um, any of that is all in centralized. There are a couple that are unique, like the TMC. That's actually an outsourced program, but we assist them with collecting and managing the vendor. So the way as we are organized is that there's about 110 people on the IT staff, and for those, it used to be for us, say those departments that are large enough users of technology, but now almost all the departments are large enough users of technology. We, we, we certainly assign a team to them. I mentioned I have a manager who actually runs a team that supports community development. He also has parks, and he also has, um, he has park community development, and what's his third one? Um, but he still has one other area. And then I have a director over them. But, so we have a team, but, but in parks, because they're large, or in GOT because they're large, they're, they belong, the staff belong to IT, but they actually sit out in that department. So that's one way. The second way is we have quite a few at all levels, meetings where we um, coordinate and bring the various. We started putting the digital strategy together um, a, a couple of years ago, actually about a year and a half ago. I asked the their partner vendor, and I said, can you meet with the agency and department heads and get their business objectives? Because I want to make sure our digital strategy isn't just IT based. Our guiding principles are, you know, we're an enabler and we're a catalyst. Um, you don't ever build anything for IT sake. So I wanted them to get with all the agencies, either directors, etc. So they did. They scheduled these meetings, and it, to 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 a almost to, to the T, every one of them said, "We're not starting. Where's our IT rep?" Um, and I had to come in and explain to them that the vendor wasn't doing this on their own. We intentionally did not want their IT rep from my department in that meeting with them that we were trying to get their business objectives that had nothing to do with IT. Um, so, so I think we've been pretty successful in integrating ourselves in with the departments and getting their trust so that they bring it to us. I will say, and this is something you hear from everyone, so it's not a Sharon family smart thing, but you've got to know the business. And that's what I, I hand on into my team. You know, the way, the reason I can do some of this is I, I know my peers. I go to their meetings. I, I'm, you know, I, I see them. I know what they do in each of their agencies and departments. So when I see something new that I think they may benefit from, um, like the indoor, um, you know, indoor modeling that Esri's getting ready to roll out, I bring it in. I look at it. If I think they're going to benefit from it, I put it in front of them right away. And I don't just go buy it. I see if they want it. Um, but it, it comes from my team, and I, I think. You've got to have that relationship where you, and this is not true just for government. Thank you, Sharon, uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, and everyone, again, this one, we'll have the, the deck posted on the Smart Community site um, in the next day or so. Uh, offline Q&A. Absolutely. Anybody can call me. But, and and I, 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 I'm a, we pirate things in, the, in our side of the house when it comes to apps with other, other agencies and departments. So, 
Feel free if there's anything in there you're interested in, but let us know. We'll be glad to share how we did it. Great. Aaron, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Sharon or Greta or Heather, if you're on, we're just going to get the Adam set up so he can be part of the web. Adam, just to check check if uh, Sharon anybody else can see. Okay, can uh, can the people remotely see the, the PowerPoint? You won't be able to hear me, sir. I'm I'm seeing a picture of the floor right now. Picture of the floor. Looks like a camera in the room. Uh, yeah, there you go. to see your beautiful state. I'm all the way up here. Uh, I, I came here from Charlotte, North Carolina, so it was a bit of a haul yesterday. Um, but uh, really love it here. So thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you guys. Uh, and this is uh, this is our standard corporate uh, presentation on delivering smart communities and smart cities through a geospatial strategy. So it's written exactly for the Alaska 
Smart Communities Forum, and that's great. But actually, I do a lot of presenting, and I do a lot of research, and a lot of work um, in the whole Smart Communities thing, or whatever. And just me as a person, just personally, I hate the term smart. Like, because there's everything. I mean, there are smart diapers now. <laughs> and you see smart everything, and smart starts to lose its good meaning, right? And the other thing I don't like about it is that some community does not have a smart community initiative. Does that mean they're stupid? Right? So I personally just don't like that, that thing. I appreciate the use of it here in the forum. So I would rather rename uh, this presentation Empowering an Analytics-Driven Organization to do a Geospatial Strategy. To me, uh, I don't like data driven either because data doesn't drive anything. You can have all the data in the world. If you don't do anything with it, it doesn't drive anything. So to me, the word data, the term data driven isn't right either. I like analytics driven because that's what allows you to make better decisions and move forward. So that's that's my term. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> so just like everybody else is, the other problem with is how do you define smart? You can ask ten different people and get ten different uh, reactions from that. So uh, smart is many different things. Um, and again, the, the term is used for so many things, smart transit, budgets, uh, smart maps, smart planning, smart uh, operations, you name it. Again, it tends to lose. So what uh, Esri does is we don't define smart. We're just going to show you examples of organizations using our technology to be smart and make the right decisions. And just forget about what smart is and what it is. Uh, and in, in government, you know, location is never an afterthought. Almost every single piece of data that a government agency uses has location component. So most, I think, CIOs, when they're thinking about being smart or having smart initiatives or digital transformations, like Sharon was talking about, um, I don't think they think about leading with GIS. But because almost all of your data has this locational component, you should be leading with GIS. It should be at the forefront of any of your smart initiatives or any of your digital transformation initiatives. Because if you're not using GIS, you're leaving a whole lot of money on the table and a lot of intel by using that spatial component. So we can use this as a GIS as a foundational system uh, as being part of a smart community or having a digital transformation initiative. Uh, and it, is support, it can support all aspects of government from dealing with the citizen uh, things like health and homelessness and being connected and the opioid crisis and housing and economic opportunity and aging population, you name it. Uh, infrastructure, uh, broadband, aging structures, telecom, transportation, your, your facilities, uh, bridges, land use, all of that can be dealt with. Uh, any of your environmental initiatives, green infrastructure, open space, climate, air quality, sea level rise, you name it, it can be dealt with with the GIS. And then integrating other technologies such as sensors, uh, artificial intelligence, auto, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, auto, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, etc. GIS can really be a common part of all of this, no matter what you're doing with your data in, in government. And it starts with identifying priorities. So this is really where it comes to what do you think a smart community is. Um, a lot of people would, would say, oh, I want my community to be livable, or I want it to be sustainable or resilient or well-run, or healthy, or safe, or prosperous. These are the kinds of initiatives that smart communities are usually um, working on and utilizing technology to do it. So um, once you have priorities, and they can be whatever these are, they can be other priorities, it's just about then applying the technology to create the solutions that allow you to move forward with those initiatives. And what we've noticed from our work a long time, and what's interesting is we've been working with communities for, you know, as recent 50 years old this year. So we've been doing this a long time. We are not a newcomer to the IT industry. We basically defined and created the whole GIS market uh, and, and uh, software world out there. We've been, we've been having smart communities until, we've been helping soft smart communities before the word smart communities was ever used. Uh, and basically, our work, um, looking at that and distilling it down and looking at it in a smart communities way, we found that there's really four technology tenants that any smart community um, can utilize to, to be smart. So that is planning and engineering, looking at urban and community design, operational efficiencies, providing good government services and making those services better and more efficient, uh, maybe providing new services that didn't exist before. Uh, again, 
providing analytics-driven performance, so looking at data and analytics and making better decisions. And then lastly, civic inclusion, connecting, using the technology to connect with the community. So these are basically the four different areas uh, the way geospatial can help a community become smart or you know, achieve their smart initiatives. So starting in planning and engineering, lots of different things here. Uh, you saw several of these examples uh, in, in Sharon's previous presentation. But all of that community design work around the Brave Stadium, that was all done, uh, a lot of it was done in GIS and three dimensions. Uh, looking at all of it and the, the fast track that they had to permit and get all that stuff through the system and, and under construction and built would, could not have been done with, without with the tools that they use. So um, you could be using this for multimodal planning, mobility planning, economic growth, natural environment, sustainability, green infrastructure, um, human-centered design, climate change, et cetera, can all be done with this technology. And so what I'd like to do is show a short video here of uh, a redevelopment success story. This is from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, on how they used three-dimensional technology um, for to secure economic and investment opportunities for the future. So I'm going to run this short video here. Let's hope that the uh, let's hope that the uh, audio comes through. And um, and um, and and um, 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 I'll provide the link to the video and you guys can watch that. But it's great three minutes. And they talk about how they were able to secure economic investment by doing some 3D modeling and actually showcasing the property on exactly what it would look like. So we have technologies where not only can you do that, but you can also do augmented reality. So you could actually put on an Oculus Rift virtual reality headset and walk through the development as if it was around today. So I could walk through this building in a digital mode. You could even, um, and part of that involves exporting it out to a game engine, right? So you can do this with a Xbox controller. You can actually walk through, and you can look at full 360 degrees and see exactly what it's like. So the future is here. The future is now. It's being used to, um, for communities to be uh, improvements like this. Um, so again, some other examples. Uh, Sacramento Area Council of Governments in California. They identified key locations to install bike parking. Uh, Manatee County, Florida, looking at sea level rise analysis. Uh, here's Cobb County on the prioritization of their street repaving that, that Sharon talked about. Um, Boston in the middle there at the top is looking at the impact of proposed development. Uh, and again, in 3D and doing some zoning changes uh, and, and uh, perspective zoning uh, scenarios and seeing the effects in 3D. Um, City of Peachtree Street Corners, Georgia used theirs for an autonomous vehicle test track. And then South Korea is using it for urban redevelopment as well. So there's very, very, there's lots of uses and lots of case studies available to you here um, in the planning and engineering realm. And in this, uh, in this realm, the different pieces of our ArcGIS solution that works here, uh, first on the desktop, ArcGIS Pro with spatial analytics, you can integrate BIM data that allows you to bring in internal interior 3D uh, data into your environment, uh, imagery 3D, um, then we get on the 3D side, we've got again the collaborative 3D design, uh, City Engine, one of our products, you can design, manage, and measure impacts. What's really cool is if you have a proposed development and you've got it in 3D, you can actually put it out on the web and allow the public to look at it to see how it's going to interact with their neighborhood. And they can even click on the web app and leave a comment and say, you know, from this, this is what it looks like from my front porch, and I don't like the following this, or I wish there were these things. What have you. So you can really engage the community in a new way and get some real input from them um, above and beyond them yelling and screaming at the meeting, right, where you're trying to get past. So uh, these ways really help include the community. And again, this works fully through on the web as well. Uh, operational efficiencies, again, another great way to define smart communities, uh, making smart decisions, saving money, doing things faster, doing things better, getting rid of paper. Uh, doing things digitally. Uh, we, we 
get a lot of people doing this. Um, what's interesting is that GIS folks don't normally think this way about how much money they're saving, but um, there's a, a gentleman out of, out of Utah, Wade Kloos, uh, who works at Utah DNR, and he focuses every single project, he calculates the ROI, the return on investment for it, for every single project he does. And every GIS needs to start to do that, uh, because it's all about the business. It's not about the technology, it's about the impact that you're having. And when you're looking at budgets, and budgets get tight, and people want to cut a GIS budget, if you can show them the value of that, it makes a good deal. So we should always be thinking about that. There's lots of operational efficiencies. Um, uh, we have, and, and Sharon showed an example of them implementing workforce for their senior transportation services. Uh, we had another, uh, we had three customers in the southeast, back where I'm from, that implemented that technology. One of them is saving over $62,000 a year in labor. Um, another one got their response time down from when a service ticket came in, it was taking them 33 hours to respond to that. That's down now down to eight hours. And another um, organization is saving seven and a half staff hours per week. So they're getting almost another day out of their staff because of that. So this stuff can really um, drive efficiency. Um, I had another video, but I'll give you a link to it later about how Pasadena, California was using the technology to manage the Rose Parade. And this was very similar to what Sharon talked about with the Super Bowl uh, back in Cobb County. So they had trackers on all the officers. They needed to see exactly where all the officers were in real time. They had dashboards, they had cameras, all of it, and it was all, main, um, all manned by um, public safety personnel that were able to see and react to everything uh, that, they could uh, buy traffic, live weather, you name it. So anytime there's any kind of event, uh, this technology is really, really helpful in managing that in a public safety uh, manner. So again, some other examples, uh, Palm Beach County, Florida, for their mosquito inspections, they again took a paper-based process and, and made it fully digital. Uh, St. Johns County, Florida in the lower left with their asset uh, management and asset maintenance. Uh, facilities management uh, is applicable. Uh, Jones Creek, Georgia, in the upper, in the middle here, uh, at the top, you can see what looks like uh, an Amazon Alexa device. So they actually created an Alexa skill. So if you live in the city of Johns Creek and you have an Alexa, you can download the city of Johns Creek skill, and I can simply say, Alexa, tell me where the next city council meeting is. Alexa will tell you. And I can say, Alexa, tell me what day of the week is my trash pickup. Tell you. So that's pretty cool and a new way to engage the public and make it even easier. They don't have to pick up the phone. They don't even have to go to a website or do anything. It's just ask Alexa. She'll tell them that. Now, Johns Creek, um, which is not far from, from Cobb County, they're a suburb of Atlanta. They're a population of about 84,000 people. And they do some of our most um, innovative stuff I've ever seen come out of a GIS department. You know how big their GIS department is? Two people. Okay. So people think you have to be New York City or LA to do this cutting edge stuff. You don't. You just have to have innovative people that are creative and are willing to go out there on the land and do it. One of the new things he just did in an article just came out. I got an email this morning. I saw this when he was working on it and I about fell out of my chair. It was so cool. So um, in your Johns Creek is a, is a uh, whitewater raft, some of the best whitewater rafting on the East Coast. So they do a lot of, they have a lot of uh, obviously folks white water rafting this river and so people get in trouble so their emergency responders have to do swift water rescues sometimes at night or sometimes in low visibility so what they've done and the, the people that respond they know that river and they know the bad parts and where the certain rocks are where the eddies are where the whirlpools and all that kind of stuff so they've got that what they did is they actually mapped all of those features of the, the river run and then they've got tablets now with uh, augmented reality, and he put um, he put night vision lenses on the tablet. So if I'm a paramedic responding to a swift water rescue at, in in the dark, I can hold the tablet up and see exactly where the whirlpool and the rocks are and everything in a way to to design my um, my my emergency response to that incident. I mean, really crazy cool stuff down in Johns Creek. Uh, Iowa DOT, also very innovative. Um, they've got some great um, efficiencies built around their bridge conditions and other things. And then in the lower right here, the Seminole Tribe of Florida 
seeing big savings on doing inspections with drone imagery. So when you're inspecting like a water tower or anything tall structure, you used to have to get somebody to climb it or hire a helicopter or whatnot. Now you can go out there with a drone, fly it around, process the imagery in about an hour, and you can do the entire inspection right there from a the drone. Um, so we have a whole, a lot of these operational efficiencies come from the field work because there's a lot of field work that goes on. Field work is expensive and field work is dangerous. N3 has a complete set of solutions for um, the field. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight different applications that we have to serve the field. People are like, why do you need eight different applications? Well, there are eight different workflows that uh, each of these um, deals with. But what's interesting is all of these apps talk to each other. So you can string them together to get even more efficiency. Um, so you can string together workforce where I'm getting the work um, request in. I can get my navigator to navigate me to that route. And then once I get there, I can then use another application to collect the data. And all of them talk to each other. They automatically come up. Once I arrive, it knows and it automatically opens the next app right to the collection. So um, these things are really intelligent. They work well together. And again, here the ROI is really easy to calculate because it's time and it's gas and it's carbon emissions and it's, it's a lot of other things. Uh, and then a lot of this stuff you might not realize, but we have a whole set of RGIS solutions. So you don't have to custom create these solutions. We have a whole group that does nothing but talks to cities and counties and state agencies and finds out your workflows. And then we create solutions for you. And these solutions are free. And they're open source. And you can just download them. And you can configure them without writing any code. They're supported by tech support. When we come out with a new version of ArcGIS and they break, we'll come out with a new version of the solution. So you roll right along. So you don't have to be a computer programmer either to deploy these. You can literally do it in minutes. So we want to make sure you're aware of those and can take advantage of them. So the, um, the last one here is an analytics-driven performance. So again, dashboards, performance management, IoT. So a lot of people talk about IoT and Internet of Things and all these sensors. What's common about every single sensor that's a piece of IoT? It has a location. So whether that's a, a sensor that's still, like a river gauge or a flood gauge or maybe an air quality gauge or what have you, or it's a person, or a vehicle, or a pelican, which they track in Utah. Um, no matter what it is, it has a location. So if you're using IoT anywhere in your organization, it should be integrated with your GIS, because it's got a location. And we can do so much with that. Um, Sharon talked about Waze and the uh, Connected Citizens Program. Um, every city or county should be a part of that program, because it really helps things. When you shut down a road to do some construction project, you're part of the Waze program, and they are automatically monitoring your closed roads layer. As soon as it's closed, they know about it, and then everybody using Waze and everybody using Google will get routed around it. If not, everybody's going to keep getting routed down your closed road, and that causes lots of problems. There's a lot, lot of other positive things that can come out of that Waze relationship. It's free. Um, I would definitely look into the Waze Connected Citizens program. Uh, real time is key to. Um, people are starting to make decisions with data. Uh, they want to make it with the most recent data um, that they can. So uh, live or real-time data is key. Uh, and again, um, we've got great solutions in, in GIS for that as well. Uh, lots of different analytics. Uh, artificial intelligence is getting, we're getting there. Uh, Sharon alluded to it too. Uh, there's, once you get to the big data realm, if you have sensors and sensors are collecting a uh, a piece of data every so many seconds or minutes, guess what? That creates big data very, very fast. And so once you get big data, the only way to really dive into it and pull a lot of great analytics out of it is using artificial intelligence and machine learning because you can automate it and you can look at a billion different data points and have a computer do it for you. Um, so we're working with some agencies that are putting um, cameras on their vehicles, they're driving them around, they're then getting the the artificial intelligence to look at every single photo and it can pull out where the cracks and the potholes are and automatically tell you um, very, very quickly. Okay, so and again, the, the feature uh, case study was Cobb County, but you just heard it directly from Sharon all about it. Um, there's several different videos we have of Sharon and other people from Cobb County talking about how they're using GIS to drive digital transformation to become a smart county. 
Uh, I can make sure I get you links to all those videos if you want to learn more uh, about what they're doing over there. Um, some other examples, um, you heard Todd, but uh, Tempe, Arizona, in the upper right, um, that is an opioid abuse monitoring dashboard. That one is available to the public. So one of the things here is people talk about open data, and oh, I'm going to deploy open data because that's a great thing. And so what they have is they have a website with all their data on it. What does that do for the average citizen? Zero, right? Basically, you're checking the open data box. Yeah, we do open data. That's not, to me, what I call real open data. That dashboard, that's actionable open data. If we're going to stop the opioid crisis, that means all of us need to work together. These are very complex issues. And so if you're going to help at your citizen level um, work on the opioid crisis, you need to understand the complexity and how it um, affects you in your neighborhood and maybe where you work. So you need to be able to go to an app that anybody can use without taking a class and just hit some buttons and do some drop downs and you can see exactly how the opioid epidemic is affecting your life and how you can help uh, solve it. So that's action, what I call actionable open data and um, that's using just uh, one of our dashboard products right there. Uh, there's Baton Rouge with some crime analysis and then here's Iowa DOT, they're doing real time monitoring of snow operations. So they have actual cameras on the snow plows. They have sensors on the snow plow. They know when the plow is up, when the plow is down, when the plow is deploying salt or if it's um, debrine, what have you. They've got all kinds of monitors and they know exactly what's going on. One of the interesting things that they also do at, at Iowa DOT is they calculate cost. So they know exactly. You can put in the route for the drive from it's a it's an open checkbook transparency of, of uh, finances back to the, to the citizens because obviously it's, it's key to have those roads open to, to move around and you need to know how much it's costing to, to do that. Um, that's a cut, cut community intelligence center and then uh, they, that's for Coral Gables, Florida. Again, that's a pretty small city as well, but lots of great examples. There are many, many more than this. Um, and again, the features on our side that are providing the, the accessibility of these kinds of solutions, uh, web GIS, uh, operations dashboard or R2S solutions, uh, real time uh, that supports this high velocity data streams, uh, integrating sensor networks and IoT, tracking, monitoring, you can get alerts. If certain things happen, you can set up a geofence. So if somebody crosses into an area, you can get an alert. Um, integrate with ABL, as you saw, Cobb has done. Insights for RGIS, that's in the lower left here. Uh, that's what Sharon talked about in regard to their senior services. This is a web-based product that's drag and drop. So those fancy analyses that you see there, that doesn't have to be a data scientist or a GIS professional. You can actually take anybody in your organization and teach them how to use insights. And that's when you're really being smart and getting, um, making movement in your organization. I, can, I don't have to have people go through data specialists to find out what's happening uh, in their organization. You can just say, okay, here, we've got all this data. I'm gonna show you how to use this tool and, and make a better decision. And then some, again, AI and machine learning um, tools on the bottom, property condition survey, uh, feature identification, so you can teach the computer to pull things out, uh, photos as well. You can drive your streets and take photos, and then you can teach the computer to pull out all the signs. And then next thing you know, you have all the locations of all the signs in your city, um, simply by machine learning and AI on that. Um, you can start to get into predictive analytics. Um, we, uh, people were taking property, property photos of the properties, and then they were having people um, rate the condition of the property, both public photos and the whole, and then they opened it up to crowdsource to the public. So if you wanted to help with this survey, you could go in there and do it. Well, then they just got into machine learning. The computer just takes care of that in a few days. It does it itself. So, so this is really like the golden age of where we are with this technology, the ability uh, to bring real change. A big, powerful part of this technology, uh, uh, engage the community, get them up to speed, get them to feel a part of the community, allow them to give feedback, et cetera, so collaboration, crowdsourcing, um, connected citizens, at-risk populations, et cetera. Uh, one of the great examples here is what San Bernardino County is doing with homeless population. I know the city of Anchorage has done a lot with our technology around homeless as well. Um, San Bernardino County doing some of the similar stuff. One of the things that they did is, uh, you know, they've got the same thing as Anchorage here with the dashboard and the, and the, the mobile uh, pieces out in, in the field and the crowdsourcing as well but they used this in an emergency situation because they had uh, really bad flooding and they were able to identify 
where the known homeless encampments were, and if they were in a predicted flood area, they were proactively going there ahead of time and helping them evacuate. So it was really, really instrumental. So not only is it saving them time and money, but it's allowing them to respond more quickly to emergencies like that um, and, and be more inclusive and be more effective. Some other examples here, uh, Sonoma County, California with fire debris cleanup status, Hillsborough County with their CIP program. Uh, CIP is a big one because I know a lot of times when a, a city or county puts out their CIP, they put it out in a 100-page PDF or a, a, a PowerPoint. And if I'm a citizen, I want to see what part of that CIP is affecting me. I've either got to go to the meeting and watch the three-hour video or scroll through 100 pages. But if I can open up a map and zoom to my house and my neighborhood and instantly see all the projects that are being going to be happening in my community, then that's much more effective. So we're, we're seeing a lot of things. And what's interesting here, too, in, in, in uh, instances like that, is uh, one of the biggest users I've seen of GIS to certain uh, cities and counties is actually the communications department. Like I would have thought of work, work in the communications department when I was a GIS manager back in the day. But once you talk to a communications department and you show them tools like these dashboards and these story maps and other things, uh, they can become one of the biggest users of GIS and really help engage the community better. Um, you can see the Cobb County senior citizens in the lower left. Uh, Philadelphia is, has a stress index on their neighborhood, so different types of stress, economic stress, uh, other things, uh, Grand Rapids homelessness, and then uh, Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority utilizing the hub. So the different pieces here, the RTS platform, they can help with civic inclusion, maps, open data, our solutions, which I've mentioned, uh, community data in the upper right. So we've got a whole bunch of uh, demographics available to you. Um, some maps already set up. You just need to zoom your area. And you can create a map that shows poverty in your area. Uh, and then story maps, which are do-it-yourself web, interactive web apps that are really, really, really great. People are using these instead of PowerPoint, instead of PDFs. Create an interactive website uh, full of maps and, and multimedia, et cetera. So um, there's really tons of tools here for you to take advantage of. So again, the smart communities start with location, but to use location effectively in an organization, you have to have a strategy. And almost, I can tell you from, I have real data on this, most agencies that have a GIS do not have a GIS community plan. I've done a study on this, and it, right now it's showing me 64% the organizations that have GIS do not have a strategic plan. If you do not have a strategic plan, you're not going to be as successful as you should be with the technology. Uh, it doesn't just happen overnight. What you saw COP do doesn't happen by accident. You have to have a plan. And that includes a foundation of embracing the platform. You have to have an approach that defines priorities and needs. You have to have a system of how to adopt the technology and assess the resources, and then you implement it. So the way I talk about it is, Usually, GIS people go find technology and then go look for a problem. That's backwards. Okay? You need to find the problem and then go find the technology. So the way things should work, especially if you've got a smart community initiative, those are goals. They have a smart community and we want to get rid of homelessness. And okay, our goal is to reduce homelessness. So then, what are the challenges to that goal? Well, the challenges is finding where are the homeless? Who are they? What kind of services do they need? All those challenges. Once I have those challenges, I can then look for GIS solutions on how they find those, how we can help solve those challenges. And if I do that, guess what? Wow, I have a business value tied to my GIS because my GIS is actually helping me with that goal or initiative, right? So this should be the, the flow of GIS work in any organization, not, wow, look at this cool, shiny thing I found. Where can we use it, right? which is what most, most folks do. And so Esri, through working with customers for many, many years, we've created this kind of um, um, structure of how best to have a geospatial strategy. So number one is first understand. Understand the organization. Understand its goals and challenges. Number two, create a plan to help use the technology to solve those challenges and meet those goals. And then lastly is act. And not just run out there and implement it, but first prepare, implement it, operate it, and then cheat. Maybe review it and say, did we do it right? Or did we do it wrong? Or what could we improve? And then maybe fix it, do it again, and then go back and revisit the initiatives and the goals and the challenges, because those are changing all the time. So a strategy isn't a one-time thing that you create 
and then 10 years later, maybe we should redo our strategy. This is wrapped into everyday work. So again, um, this is just comes from our work with, with successful customers across the country over many, many years. So bottom line here, every community can be a smart community from the smallest community to the largest. The tools are there. Most of you are, are Esri customers. You have access to RGIS. We work with any size community. Uh, we've got lots of tools that are easy to implement very quickly. Don't cost a whole lot of money. It can make a really, really big difference. But I remember when I was an account manager, my mission is to get all of, as many of my customers as possible to be case studies that you see up here on the slide, like Cobb County, right? And I worked with Cobb County. And I worked with Pinellas County. And I heard that they presented to you as well. Um, they're another really, really great organization that's doing wonderful things with, uh, with the platform. So that's all I have. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, I know there's questions out there. Yeah. Uh, I know one thing is if in the mess where we have you know, a lot of the similar you know, problems and you can see that they look great work you know, everyone else is doing, but I know one thing as far as the emergency services go with the whole putting these tools in front of them because we have a lot of problems where they're doing exactly what you talked about with using their personal phone because there's not a tool to integrate with their CAD system. And so one thing that's been pushed up uh, us from delivering those tools is that we can't use Esri products for dispatch reasons. So what you know, I, a lot of things I see, a lot of those dashboards I see, I can't see but think that they are going to use those in, the, in an instance. Even seeing their assets, that's to me, it's, they're leveraging that to know how to dispatch. And so I'm, I'm curious how they've got around that or how we can get around it at the borough so we can start providing some of these great tools to our emergency service uh, team. So, is this one on? So they can hear me remotely. Oh, yeah, that, that's a great question, but I'm going to totally dodge it. <laughs> but I would just get you in touch with our public safety team. They know a lot more about it than I do. They work with customers across the globe every day on that. So I guarantee they know the answer to that. So I'm going to defer that to the expert. But that's a great, great question. Our dispatch center uses Esri, so I don't, it's a matter of software being compatible. It's not, it doesn't work. Yeah, and I think that in the past we've had that pushback, so we couldn't display that information. In a way, leveraging this, this platform. And so I'm not again, sure what the fell or what fell through as far as the safety center, but it's again, I hear all the time what it runs on there. If there's specifics on, on security, you run the data as well. Obviously, if there's a crime at a specific location, you don't want names of the exact address known. Um, so there are ways to get around that where they can do it through the blog and they can two levels of data based on security other stuff. But again, I know little about that. I would talk to our public safety team. Here. I'll echo what Adam's saying, Kenny. And just um, my experience has been that when you're actually in the CAD RMS world, that Esri works with our partners and they take our platform and take it to a whole other level so that you're meeting the requirements of the uh, public safety CAD, you know, the, the whole response system and the security around that. However, the reason they're a partner with Esri is because the platform is still being used and as soon as you want to integrate things like um, notifications and you need to provide your whole hood security that's required for the specific workflow for the public safety folks is being met, emergency management folks, and on and on, while at the same time you're tapping to the exact same data, so you're not having to silo meet your requirements, but you are using the common platform. So Kenny, we can dive into the details of your specific um, vendors that you're using for RMS, for example, to keep that conversation going. Any other questions? to meet the, the woman who's, who's entered into the management position for Anchorage and, and Aaron at Fire and, and the variety of folks in Anchorage, this this very topic, but it, it's all over the country. It's not that you can't use the platform. It's that very careful planning and hanging the right applications on the right data for delivery occur. And we do, we do rely heavily on our partners for the actual CAD and RMS components, typically. And the emergency management space is a great space to do that. It is proven. Um, our, as Terry mentioned earlier, our disaster response team responds to disasters every day across the globe. Over the years, because of their hands-on work working on disasters, our, 
disaster solutions are proven. Like when they get parachuted in because there's a forest fire somewhere, they're deploying those solutions, right? And so they get proven in the in the in the field. And they've been used for years and years for every type of disaster you can imagine. So if there's one place you want to look at Esri solutions that are proven, that are easy to deploy, that we know the workflows backwards and forwards, it's disaster response and recovery. Um, and that's that's money, that's lives, that's like it doesn't get any better ROI than that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, when I'm a taxpayer paying my taxes, I mean, the number one thing on my list is like public safety. Like, be there for me when the flood comes. Be there when the fire or the earthquake happens. Like, and you better respond, not with paper and pencil, right? I mean, I, I, I heard a presentation from a gentleman in, uh, from Kauai when they had a, uh, in Hawaii, and they had a flood, I think last year, that was like a 500 year flood, um, and they had nothing. They had paper and pencil, uh, and it was not good. Um, so your citizens are expecting more, and the, the tools are there to improve. Great. Uh, Adam, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. I'll be, I'll be real quick. So we have uh, lunch waiting for us, So and there's plenty of food. So everyone, don't leave without having lunch. Um, I had a couple uh, slides, but I'll go ahead and uh, defer that when I send it out. There's a couple conferences coming up over the next uh, two months in September, October, and I'll highlight those on, in my message out to you. Uh, the next forum is going to be November 14th, um, 8 to noon. Um, the uh, topics we're going to have uh, BP um, and Johnson was here earlier today from BP, so she'll be able to present a GIS solution that they've deployed for all their employees. That event uh, significantly coming up in November. Um, so you know, I'm looking forward to that uh, sponsorship, as well as they'll provide you some content that you know, we had them present last uh, fall as, <clears throat> as well. Um, among the topics, joint agency partnerships. I'm hoping that we can get a lot more traction over the next 60 days. Uh, those have been works for some time on, on what Matsu has available for a platform that Palmer and Lasilla can leverage. Um, and then anything else. So I want to uh, I want to reach out to you if I had a, a couple uh, to do's for you is just kind of uh, contact me, consider the topics, and contact me to, to flesh out that agenda for November. Those are really the two, three topics I have, but I usually have space for five or six different topics. Um, and then I, you know, this is I guess I, I really like how this forum comes together. A lot of familiar faces, some newer faces, right? It's just really kind of picking up the phone, just emailing the uh, people that you see in this forum to see how you can better share the data you have or if they're doing an initiative that you might be able to leverage their, at least their learnings on, if not be able to get on the shared platform. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take a to-do to kind of follow up with Scott Nelson to see if there's some way that he could, who he said, has he reached out to and who he can, um, who he might be able to reach out to to kind of leverage an existing GIS uh, investment uh, as opposed to uh, building another uh, you know investment uh, for themselves at, at the MBA. So, um, any quick questions? So, quick comment. Yep. <clears throat> I think we saw it here uh, on Sharon's slides, but one of the keys to the uh, what we are doing here together in a smart community or smart city is uh, the executive sponsorship, right? And so really, you know, we're all working in the trenches, working hard and doing great things, but unless we really have the uh, support of the executive leadership in our organizations and our communities, uh, we can bring all the, the great tools to bear Thank with you WebEx. Visit our website at www.webex.com. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> so, uh, so what I would ask uh, all of you is if uh, when you uh, get back to your offices this week and you can kind of talk about what we have looked at here today and you can share it in your organizations and then try to get some uh, additional um, executive sponsorship, some of the leadership in your organizations to participate. You need to be in the room and you need to see some of these things. Uh, I think um, Sharon pointed that out. That, uh, we had how many directors from the different departments in Cobb County were, were at those meetings and, and seeing, seeing the tools that we're bringing. And uh, I think Adam just, just talked about this 
we got this great technology looking for a problem to solve. And um, there are problems out there. And we do have the right technologies to help solve those things, but we've got to get uh, these things married up. And, and was it uh, Heather uh, was talking about, uh, right? Talking about getting the business out of the house and the technologies out of the house uh, married up so that we can really be effective with these things. So um, I would certainly ask you, uh, I, I know I work at it, Clark. So I'm going to ask you to do it as well. Go back to your organizations and uh, try to pull in the executive leadership uh, to be part of this smart community effort. And I think we'll be uh, far more successful. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. And please have some safety.